we're now moving out of the CME specific material into voice gateways. That is a, a, a router that is able to convert between a legacy voice network like a PBX or the PSTN and voice over IP communication and vice versa. We'll start off everything by looking at the voice codecs themselves. Now there's a lot of information to cover in this nugget, so let me be brief. We're going to first review the digital conversion process that we talked about in the legacy analog stuff in digital communication. Uh, we'll then get into the common audio codecs, including a new one called ILBC, where they fit, and then how to figure out how much bandwidth you're going to require for your voice over IP network. Let us begin by paying homage to our good friend Dr. Nyquist, who is the one who created the formula to take analog waveforms, and this, this is a little review from the uh, opening nuggets of this series, taking analog waveforms of voice and electrical signals and converting those into ones and zeros and bit format that can be translated over a digital communication and sent over a digital communication. So the Nyquist theorem, in general, says if you sample a signal in regular intervals of at least twice the highest channel frequency, the samples will contain enough information to accurately reconstruct the signal. It's Jeremy's paraphrase of Nyquist's theorem. So here's where we put that to, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Some important frequencies we have the human ear can hear between 20 to 20,000 hertz. Human speech usually encompasses 200 to 9,000 hertz. The normal telephone channel that we speak on uh, usually encompasses 300 to 3,400 hertz. And the Nyquist theorem was created to uh, translate 300 to 4,000 hertz. Now that's, even though that's not the full range of human speech, that is enough to give us the sound of recognition so that we could recognize who's speaking and a clean enough reconstruction of the voice so we can sense mood and, and uh, pitch changes over the phone. So it's not going to be the full fidelity of human conversation, but it's definitely enough. So going back to the Nyquist theorem, sampling at least twice the highest channel frequency means that if we're going up to 4,000 hertz, we need to sample, if this is one second, we need to sample 8,000 times every single second. Chunk, 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 chunk. Take all these samples and generate digital values to accurately reconstruct the voice. So now let's get into the specifics of the Nyquist theorem and talk about how it works because this is going to relate directly to the voice codex and how they put voice into packets. The simple four-step recipe of Nyquist. Number one, take many samples of the analog signals, twice as many as the highest frequency. We saw that on the previous slide. Calculate a number representing each sample. That's also known as quantization. So we've got you know, all these different, uh, known, they're, they're called PAM values, pulse amplitude modulation, or electrical uh, values that represent each sample. Step three is converting that number to binary, which is also called pulse code modulation, or PCM, which gives it a binary value, like an 8-bit binary value, 1011011, you know, 0, that kind of thing, that we can send over a digital line. And then optionally, step four is to compress the signal. So we have our good friend Lassie here that says, woof, and that generates an analog waveform that we can then sample many times to put into a digital format. Let's break these down step by step. All right, now we can slow down and take a look at step one and two. Step one was to take many samples of the analog signal, again, the Nyquist theorem being two times the highest frequency. So if Nyquist said 4,000 is the highest frequency to sample, the sample size will be two times that, which is 8,000 samples per second. So all of these little lines, and there would be a lot more of them, you can see each line right here, that's my little line, represents 1 8,000th of a second. So if this were a second over here, there would actually be 8,000 little lines in between. Now this is put up to a pulse amplitude modulation, or PAM scale, which measures electrical voltage. Now, if you want to really get into the details of this, each one of these voltage areas, and, and I think, hang on, th this was, I actually talked all about this back in uh, Historic Voice, 
I'm looking for the exact title of it. I put, uh, it's in the historic voice section of this series, Digital Connectivity. And I, I go through all of this in detail there. I just want to give you a high-level overview as we blend into the codex. These pulse amplitude modulations are actually divided into specific sections. More samples are taken at the lower frequency where human voice usually resides. The further and further out, and I tried to draw it. It took me a long time to draw this thing. Further and further out, you got all these little you know, tight lines down here, and it spreads out further and further and further to where there's less samples and less um, you know, specificity, if that's, that's a good word to use. There's less specificness up here as you reach these fringe edges, edges of the frequency range. So down here, you're not going to get as accurate of a reconstruction as all of the signals that you're capturing in here. Once we've got all of these electrical signals, these PAM values, we'll then need to convert them into a binary number and that's the process of PCM pulse code modulation so if this generates we'll say you know whatever voltage negative blah blah, blah voltage PCM is gonna take that the PCM engine is gonna take that and spit out some binary value now the PCM differs based on the type of sampling that you're doing and there's one for the United States like if you use the G.711 U law codec, uh, the PCM value is going to generate a different value than if you use what the rest of the world uses, G711 A-Law. I, I think I mentioned this in the digital communication section. I said U is the uh, best one for United States and Japan. A is the best one for the or wait, no, I said uh, another place, uh, another place. So, you know, pretty much all the world uses A-Law except the United States and Japan and a few other areas use U-Law. But they, the PCM process for each of those is different. So while these are the same in that they consume the same amount of bandwidth, they are different coatings. So you have to have some kind of conversion if you're moving between that. That leads up to the step four, the optional compress the signal phase. Now we step onto the field and see the common audio codecs that are used as we communicate across the network. Now, this is a small sampling of the audio codecs that are available out there. There's many of them. Now, you can see up at the very top, I have the number one most commonly used uh, standard supported G.711. And as I mentioned, there was the two flavors of that, U-Law and A-Law. This is the direct equivalent to our legacy voice. So when we when we are, were in the old world, and you can head back to that historic voice section, we had all of the digital voice, and each channel consumed 64 kilobits per second of bandwidth, or we called that a DS0 of, of bandwidth. Well, G.711 is the voice over IP equivalent of that. It does not compress the information. It consumes 64 kilobits per second of bandwidth. Now, in the voice over IP world, it actually consumes more. Because remember, this is for the actual audio or the data. If I could write audio small enough in there. We still have all the TCP, UDP, IP, MAC address, all the headers that go on there. So usually G.711 and voice over IP ends up being around 80 kilobits per second. Show you how to figure that out a little bit later on. So we're actually getting less efficiency in voice over IP than we were in the PSDN. Now that comes up to the mean opinion score, the MOS score. The mean opinion score is a scale from 1 up to 5 where people rate the quality of the sound. Uh, the mean opinion score is a subjective test meaning you have uh, people with uh, people with they call them trained ears. I don't know what you do to qualify as a trained ear candidate but they take people with these special ears and they take them into a room and they read a phrase to them. Uh, the most common phrase that's used is uh, nowadays a chicken leg is a rare dish. They read that over the phone using all these different codecs. And the people with the trained ear rate that on a scale of one to five. Five being great, it was you know crystal clear. One being I couldn't understand a word that you said. 
So G.711 gets a rating on the MOS scale of 4.1, which is one of the best ones out there. That's almost directly equivalent to the standard PSTN. Normal PSTN audio gets a rating of around 4.0 to, it's somewhere in between 4.0 and 4.1. Little less than G.711 because you can get a cleaner sound with voice over IP. So as you come down through these different codecs, you see G.729. This is the number one compressed codec that Cisco equipment uses. Just about all Cisco equipment, the Cisco IP phones, everything, support this codec built into them. So as you speak into the phone, it can compress your audio down to, look at this, 8. Down from 64 to 8 kilobits per second. That's amazing, the amount of compression that you can get uh, on, a, on a Cisco device using G729. Now you notice we have these two different flavors of G729. G729 is not actually used too often anymore. Because the original version, while it got great scores on the mean opinion score, if you look at that, I mean, you can't really tell the difference between that. I, I can't. I can't tell the difference between that and G711. It's great quality, but it was intense on the, the processing resources. They're known as DSP. Digital signal processors. Um, so these digital signal processors were taking your voice and compressing it as you're talking, and it, this was considered a high complexity codec. So it would eat up DSPs like water. It would just go through them. So you had to equip your router with a lot of them, which are expensive, to do some decent compression. So they came out with G729A, the A Annex A variant, which gets the same amount of bandwidth and a lower mean opinion score. So you sacrifice a little quality, but you sacrifice it for more DSPs. You can actually calculate and, and do nearly double, sometimes more than double, the number of conversations of G729A per DSP as you can with the original G729. Most people look at that difference in quality and they're like, you know what? It's not enough to make that big of a difference. Meaning, people may say, uh, it sounds funny or every now and then, but if you're not listening for it, I, again, I can tell you, I've listened to all three of these, and unless I'm really listening and I'm in a really quiet room and I'm like, okay, shh, shh, shh don't talk, okay, okay, I can tell there's something a little different on this one, you're not telling. I mean, you can't really tell the difference, and for that, it's worth it to get double the DSPs back, because those are expensive. Uh, then you come down you know, to G726. These are just some other codecs uh, that come out. Not as much compression. These are older ones. Uh, don't give you as good of a mean opinion score. And that's why Cisco went with G729 and G729A. Now, that leads us down to the next generation. Compressed codecs have long since been difficult. Meaning, a lot of them are proprietary, uh, like, you know, no one else uses G729 that I know of other than Cisco. They, you know, this is a Cisco codec, not many people use it. You go to Avaya, they've got their own compressed codec, you know, and each one has its advantages, disadvantages, some are high complexity, some are medium. So, the industry has been after a codec that could be open source, industry standard, meaning anybody can use this thing, any vendor is allowed to use it, and gives you high quality for low bandwidth. With ILBC, they were successful. Look at that. 15.4 kilobits per second. Okay, sure, it's not as good as 8, but look at that. 4.1 mean opinion score. You don't see any compressed codec that's able to get even close to that. I mean, uh, okay, I guess close, but you can't touch that with any other compressed codec. The same quality as uncompressed audio, but saving, what, three, four times the bandwidth by compressing it down there? It's amazing. So the new Cisco IP phones, and when I say new, I mean like 7941, 7940. 61. The original 7940s and 60s and, and uh, 7970s don't support ILBC. That's, it's too new of a codec. The newer ones have the chipset that's able to support it. This one I can see in the future, and maybe even by the time you're using it, this one will be a major player in the industry. You get to choose which codec you use on your network. Much of what goes into the choice of codec on your network is the amount of bandwidth that it's going to consume. And right now I'm going to transition us now into a discussion on how you can figure out 
how much total bandwidth a voice over IP call will take on the network. I mean, it's kind of like any network environment, or uh, we could even take this to the roads. I mean, when, when a freeway designer designs freeways, they don't just look at it and say, ah, I think two lanes will do or four lanes will do. They go through all kinds of calculations and say, well, let, you know, rush hour, we'll have this number of cars on the road, you know, all this kind of stuff, the best effort guess of, of the amount of traffic they're going to get. In the same sense, we can't just throw voice on our network and say, I, I hope I got enough bandwidth to handle it. We have to know exactly how much bandwidth is going to be out there. Now, a lot of times we can look at these codecs like G711 and say, oh, well, that one consumes, let me switch colors on my pen here. This one consumes you know, 64 kilobits per second. I know that. Um, G729, that's 8 kilobits per second. We saw that one, and oh, here's one. The old, old, old Cisco phones, they don't even make them anymore, use this one. This was 6.3 kilobits per second of bandwidth. So you can look at this and go, oh, okay, well, I have a, a rough idea of how, my, uh, how much bandwidth they'll consume. But you'll need to, to have something more accurate than that. This is just for the audio. You want to know how much bandwidth total, including all the headers and stuff like that, it's going to consume when it goes across the network. So, let's take G711. When you, when you say, I'm going to use G711, the first thing that you want to look at is what sample size you plan on using. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to the CME voice router. Let me actually just jump back here and um, I'm going to clear the whole screen off. Um, we're going to get into something known as a dial peer. And dial peers really dictate the structure of your voice network and the, the routing table for voice. And one of the things that you'll see when we configure dial peers, we'll say dial peer voice uh, 50 voice over IP. Again, what, more on this when we get into gateways, just a, a preview right now. You get to choose what kind of codec you use when you speak to, to another side of the network, like when you're talking from your network to another voice over IP network. I'll say the codec and just hit question mark, and it spills out a list of codecs supported by this router. You see our G711ULAW and ALAW right there. ILBC is right there, and it's, it's, uh, it's running You know G729. You can see that guy running right there. Uh, they also show Annex B. Annex B has VAD, which is voice activity detection. Talk about that in a moment. That can save you some bandwidth. So right now we're looking at G711, we'll say ULAW, because I'm in the United States. So I'll say, I want to use the codec G711 ULAW, and it gives me the option to specify the number of bytes per frame. This is how, min how much data do you want to put in for each frame of audio, and this is also known as your sample size, the amount of audio that is included in each packet. Now, by default, every packet that you send on the wire includes 20 milliseconds. That's the default sample size of audio. Having larger samples, like if I were to increase that to say 30 milliseconds, saves you bandwidth because you actually can get away in sending less packets. Because, you know, if I put more audio in my packets, that's less packets overall and less header information, so you get bandwidth savings, but the larger your sample is, the more delay you end up having. So if I have a 30 millisecond packet, I have to wait 10 milliseconds longer to get audio from the user and put it in the packet, which the longer your delay, this is known as the coder delay, by the way, uh, the more quality of service issues you may run into. So as we calculate our, our um, bandwidth, how much bandwidth we're going to need for this audio, we need to use this formula. Now, first thing, let me say, there's many ways to calculate bandwidth. This is the one that makes the most sense in my head. We have bytes per sample equals the sample size times codec bandwidth divided by 8. So what we're doing here is this is a formula that will give us the number of bytes per sample in each packet. In order to cal calculate the amount of bandwidth that I'm going to be sending, this is a value I need, bytes per sample. Now you come back over here and you see that we have, you know, how many bytes for each one. For G, codec G711 ULA bytes is, we either type in 80, 160, or 240. But what does that mean? I mean, sure, I could throw the value 240 out there, but I mean, wh what is that? Is that like 30 milliseconds of audio? Is that 20? What is that? So. What we can do here is use this formula. You can see bytes per sample, which 
I just typed in was 240. So I'm saying 240 bytes are going to be put in this packet. So if I put 240 equals sample size, you know, this is in milliseconds what the sample size is. We don't know this value. Sample size is our variable, if you will, uh, times the codec bandwidth. That'll be our 64,000. This is in bits per second, by the way. 64,000, because that's G711, 64 kilobits per second, or 64,000 bits per second, divided by 8, that will give us what our sample size is in milliseconds. So, doing some, some uh, arithmetic here, I'm going to have to say, okay, well, in order to get that sample size, let's bust out our calculator, which, by the way, you don't have a calculator on the exam. Uh, so, we'll say, you know, 240 in order, well, let me let me go back to algebra. I know it had been a while for me when I first got into this. So, in order to figure out what sample size is, what what sample size that'll give me, I need to multiply both sides by eight, right? I need to get the variable by itself. So I'll multiply this side by eight. So we'll say times eight, and we'll multiply this side by eight. So, you know, this will cross out the eight over here. That's gone. And bring up the calculator. Two forty times eight is 1920. So I've got 1920 um, as, my, as my value over here now. So kind of scribble that out. So now I've got sample size times 64,000 that's left over. Well, again, to get sample size on its own, I need to divide both sides by 64,000. 64,000. So 1920 divided by 64,000. Actually, I know there's a, a glitch on my slide. I'll have to show this to you. I'll hit uh, enter on that, and it comes out with 0.03. So sample size over here, I'll flip it around, equals 0.03. And my mistake is right here. This is sample size, sorry, in seconds. So 0.03 is 30 milliseconds. Milliseconds is one one thousandth of a second, so that would be three zero, 30 milliseconds that my sample size is. So if I were to use a sample size, so let me jump back here, a sample size of 240 bytes, that's a sample size of 30 milliseconds. Now using that, I can, I can estimate, you know, divide 240 by 80, and that's three, so 80 must be 10 milliseconds, this must be 20 milliseconds, and this one we just figured out is 30 milliseconds. So let's say, you know, I'll scribble all this out. Let's say that I'm going to use a 20, I'm going to use the default 20 millisecond sample size for G711. I now know that that will generate a payload of 160 bytes per packet, right? 60 milliseconds equals 160 bytes per packet. That's G711 audio. Okay, that's the first step of figuring out how much bandwidth I need. Now I'm going to carry that value over to this slide. We figured out G711 with a 20 millisecond sample size equals 160 bytes. Because now to that, I need to add in my data link and network overhead. So we've got the Ethernet frame relay or PPP, three common data link layer uh, communication styles, depending on which one you're using, you need to add in a specific amount of data. So we're, well, let's say we're using G711, 20 millisecond sample size, over an Ethernet network. That will take our 160 per packet plus 18 bytes of overhead for our Ethernet, and we now have 871, 178 bytes per packet. I'll just put uh, bytes per packet, like that. So that's the data link overhead. We now need to add in our network overhead. Now, thankfully, this one is not one that's hard to remember. You see IP, UDP, and RTP. This is actually network and transport layer. The IP layer is always 20 bytes. UDP and RTP are always 8 and 12 bytes of header information. The best way I always remember this, quickest way for me to remember, is network plus transport layer equals 40 bytes. It's always 40 bytes of data. It's almost a, a static value that we can put in there and say that's how much it is. So I can just go plus 40 bytes per packet. Uh, ends up being 8. That'd be 1. Carry the 1. So we're up to 218 bytes 
per packet uh, of now think G711 plus Ethernet plus IP, UDP, and RTP. We're up to 218. So let's carry that value over here. We have 218 bytes per packet. And now we get to throw in our tunneling or bonus overhead is what I call it. Um, if you are doing any kind of tunneling, like you know, generic routing encapsulation, GRE tunnels, or L2TP, or like an IPsec VPN tunnel. This is your VPNs or MPLS label switching. That's uh, that's used by service providers. Each one of these adds a certain amount of overhead to your packets. Now, thankfully, we're going over Ethernet in this case. So, unless you're doing a VPN on top of your Ethernet connections to encrypt all of your voice communications, uh, this probably isn't going to be valid. This is only if we're connecting over the internet or using some kind of WAN connection to link in that uses one of these t tunneling technologies. So finally, let's take our bytes per packet calculation into our final calculation window. Here we are, the final bandwidth calculation formula. The total bandwidth for your communication is the packet size times the number of packets per second. So our packet size was 218 bytes, right? 218 bytes per packet. Our packets per second, well, how do we figure that one out? Now, it's not, not too bad. Once you know the sample size, our sample size was what? 20 milliseconds, right? Every packet gets 20 milliseconds of audio. Well, there has to, you know, every second of audio contains 1,000 milliseconds. So if we take 1,000 divided by 20, can't believe I'm about to use a calculator for that. 1,000 divided by 20, that gives us 50. I am shamed. 50 packets per second. So take 50 times our packet size, which is 218 bytes, equals, so 50 times, where's my calculator? Right there. 50 times 218 equals 10900. So 10900, and this is going to be bytes, because that, that was the packet, the amount of bytes per second. Now, we don't usually work in bytes per second in the network world. We usually work in bits per second, right? So to figure this out one more level, we have to take uh, uh, 10,900 bytes times 8, because there's 8 bits in a byte come back over here times 8 equals 87200 87200 bits per second now again to make it a little more understandable we can divide that by a thousand to say this is about 87.2 kilobits per second of bandwidth so we're in the, the legacy voice world. We only needed 64 kilobits per second per voice channel. In the voice over IP world, we would need 87.2 kilobits per second of bandwidth to send the same uncompressed audio. So that should tell you something. Using G711 is actually less efficient bandwidth-wise than using the legacy voice equipment that existed in the, you know, in the PBX realm. So to really get bandwidth savings, we're going to need to look at compressed codecs, or at least using some of the other bandwidth savings measures. Now, before I talk about the bandwidth saving measures, let me uh, comfort some of you test takers out there, because I know some of you are studying for the CCNA voice exam. The bandwidth calculations that I just showed you most likely, I'll never say it won't be on there, but most likely won't beyond the CCNA voice exam. Uh, that, those formulas and stuff like that, they're great to, to have on you to remember, but you know, the headers and stuff like that, if, I'll, I'll tell you this, if it is going to be on there, I don't even know if I should say this, but if it is going to be on there, they are, are probably going to give you all of the values. Like you won't need to remember that Ethernet headers are 18 bytes or IP, RTP, and UDP are 40 bytes and all that. Most likely they'll give it to you all right there. But if you do get onto the CCVP and move on to the C voice exam, uh, that's where you'll you'll need to know how to calculate bandwidth just off the top of your head. So keep that in mind. Most likely won't be there, but man, is that handy information to know how much bandwidth you're going to need for any voice codec for any voice conversation. So now let's talk about the bandwidth savings measures. 
two things that we can add into voice over IP communication, and that is VAD and compressed RTP. VAD cuts out what I would call the sound of silence in our voice communication. About 35%, amazing statistic right here, 35% of an average phone call is silence. Meaning that when you, you know, hey, how's it going? Silence. Right there. It would cut out and stop sending bandwidth. The other person responds and says, oh, it's going good. Silence. There's, there's little brief intervals of silence in every voice conversation that, you know, in the, the silence level varies based on language and personality. There's all kinds of different variables that go into that. But on average, they found that when you turned on VAD, you got about 35% of your bandwidth back. That's something you could never do in the legacy voice world since you had dedicated channels for voice. Uh, going back here where we were picking our codec, you can see that one of the codecs we could use is G729 Annex B, which contains built-in VAD. Uh, notice G723, built-in VAD, built-in VAD, all of these different uh, codecs that support VAD, giving you bandwidth savings. Um, you also have the ability to add in compressed RTP. What this does is compress the network... Oh. I forgot my K there. The network and transport layer headers from 40 bytes to 2 to 4 bytes. Amazing compression technique. It actually isn't compression. It's stripping. It strips the header on both sides of the connection. Um, this, the amount, amount you save is really dependent on the codec because, you know, if you use larger codecs like G711, headers aren't that significant. Whereas G729, I mean, you kick on compressed RTP, you're getting about a 40% bandwidth savings. So there can be some significant bandwidth savings if you turn on these features. The main thing you've got to watch out for with this guy especially is processor. This is one of the most processor intensive tasks that you can add. This is actually a quality of service mechanism. Uh, processor intensive tasks that you can add. Pretty much Cisco says if you have more than a T1 worth of bandwidth that you're using, don't even borrow, uh, bother using this because you don't want to swamp your router. All right, two more valuable things I wanted to add in here at the last second. The first of those is DSPs. We've been talking about them kind of in passing up till now in the series, these digital signal processors. What are they? Well, what they are is like little miniature processors that you put inside of the router. If you look at a router's processor, I mean, you're lucky if you've got like a Pentium 2 or a Pentium 3. I mean, these things are just not designed to handle a massive amount of load like processing audio. So if we were to use the router's processor to do all of this, we would definitely swamp it. It would be overwhelmed with with uh, utilization and it would start not even being able to do its data functions. So DSP resources are little chips of processors processing power that you add to your router that offload the media processing function. So what is that? What is media processing? Media processing includes coding, that is translating the audio that you are speaking into your handset into packetized format with G711 or G729, you know, all the different codecs that are out there, that is one of the functions of media processing. Transcoding is the process of converting one codec to another. So maybe you've got, you know, G729 coming into your router and the devices attached on the other side only support G711. Well, transcoding will allow you to convert from one compressed codec to another uncompressed or maybe even another compressed that can be intense on your DSP resources and consume a lot of them but that is one of the functions of DSPs uh, media termination points this is a function when when you're sitting on the phone let's say you're on the phone with a PSTN caller and you push the hold button on your phone well when you do that I know we're used to okay they're on hold meaning they're just kinda hanging there on the phone right well, when you do that, technically, the phone hangs up on them behind the scenes. Now, the reason that the other caller doesn't immediately hear dial tone is the router takes over holding the call for you while you're doing whatever you're doing on hold. That's the function of a media termination point. This is the one that can essentially hold a call while it's on hold. It's used, obviously, for hold functions, but also momentarily when you transfer a call, when you hit conference buttons to conference a call in, all those kinds of things need media termination points. Finally, a router does conferencing. 
and that is, or, or I should say DSP resources do conferencing. That is when you have multiple phones connected and they're, they're joining conference calls and stuff like that, there has to be some kind of mixer where you've got all of these people talking in into uh, one audio stream that's being streamed out, maybe to the PSTN or coming in. Whatever the case is, you're mixing multiple audio streams into one giant streams. I, I always think of it like um, you may have seen DJs in the old clubs, you know, where you have the the DJ here with his you know hands on the table, and you've got all these record players and you know audio mix boards and microphones, and you know to, you're, you know, he's scratching the music. I tried to be a DJ for a moment there. I, I wasn't. And he's got all these different sources that he's mixing into one sound that you hear through the speakers. Well, in the same sense, the, the router becomes a little DJ with a conference call. That's one of the functions of DSPs. The number of DSPs that you need to get for your router, and by the way, this is what a DSP chip looks like. This is one of them that Cisco makes called a PVDM2. Uh, they have these little chips. These are the actual DSPs that are offloading a lot of that work from your processor. The number that you need really depends on how many calls you are planning on having, if you're planning on doing transcoding, conference calls, how big the conference calls are. There's actually a lot of factors that come in. One of the biggest ones is your codec complexity. Using the higher complexity codecs, and by the way, that new one, the ILBC, that's typically how it's written. The internet low bit where a codec does fall under the high category. They consume about double the number of DSP resources as these medium complexity codecs, which you can see G711, G729, and G729, you know, or I should say A and AB fall underneath here. So the best thing to do, and by the way, these are two different types of chipsets that you can get. The newer ones can handle more calls per chip. Best thing to find out how many to equip your router with is to go to Cisco's website and just search for DSP calculator. Just like this. <laughs> DSP calculator. Uh, did I even spell that right? This is a calculator where it will ask you what codecs you're using, how many calls you plan on having, how many conference calls, how big they are. It's like a little wizard. And by time it's said and done, it will spit out the number of DSP chips you need to buy for your router. Um, now, th the first link when you type this into Cisco's website will be what you're looking for. It does require a CCO login. So you have to register with Cisco and, and get in there good graces to get to it but this is the best way to find out how many DSP chips to buy for your router and the last thing I wanted to mention about codecs is the protocols used to carry them you might remember when I was talking back in the bandwidth calculation I said the network and uh, transport layer overhead I said you have IP which is four, uh, 20 bytes 20 bytes you have UDP which is 8 bytes and RTP which is 12 bytes of overhead in all of those. And that, that was what consumed to give you 40 bytes of overhead for every single packet that's sent. What RTP is, is the actual protocol that sends the codec. You can think of the codec as like application layer, you know, compression and translation of the audio. It will then send it down to RTP, which encapsulates it and gets it ready to send. RTP is the sound of voice. That is the protocol that carries our voice traffic. RTCP, which always goes right along with it, carries call statistics, the real-time transport control protocol. Oh, wait, I put my emphasis on the wrong one. The real-time transport control protocol, there we go. That is the one that carries the statistics between the two uh, endpoints. This one is not where anywhere near as valuable as the RTP. And I show this to you because when we get into quality of service, one of the things that you'll need to prioritize is your RTP. And a lot of people say, well, don't we need priority for this one as well? Maybe a little, but nowhere near as much as RTP. If you lose some of these packets along the way, you won't get accurate statistics. Meaning if you go on your phone and, and look at it and you can actually pull up call statistics, those, those won't be accurate. It'll be invalid. But... I mean, I, rarely, if ever, will you do that in day-to-day -day network operations. RTP is what's valuable. That's the, the audio that you need to prioritize.
What makes it difficult is every single phone call that you make uses a random even numbered RT, uh, UDP port between 16,384 and 32,767. So uh, if you're talking even ports, the last one you'll use is 32,766. So with that, RTP will grab one of these ports. That helps when you're choosing what ports to prioritize with quality of service. It'll be random. RTCP uses random odd numbered UDP ports. So both of these protocols choose ports from the same range. One uses even, one uses odd. Those are the protocols that make your voice work. I know that was a lot of information and I know I had to talk really fast going through that nugget because I really wanted to cram it all into one single nugget on voice codecs. Most of that will act as a precursor to the upcoming nuggets where we really dive into the voice gateways and then talk about communicating between our voice networks, setting up links and trunk links between uh, our voice networks and our PSTN links and so on understanding and reviewing you know the digital voice conversion process knowing how the audio codecs work and being able to calculate the amount of bandwidth really lays the foundation for inner network voice communication I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing